Hey everyone, um, here we go with the whole sermon that's going to last about 30 minutes. So if you don't have time to watch it right now, I suggest that you just pause it and set it aside and save it to when you know that you've got 30 minutes to um, watch this, maybe even Sunday morning or, or whenever you want to. Um, two weeks ago, we finished up our seven-part series, What on Earth Am I Here For?, and we finished it up, but I, as I've shared with you before, there's two sermons called post-campaign sermons. So this is the first of two post-campaign sermons entitled How to Safely Land After a Spiritual High. Now, I know you don't have notes in front of you, um, and I'm not going to take time for you to look up the scripture. So just listen when I get to the scripture. Just listen to me read it, and um, or you can jot down the scripture reference and look it up for yourself later if you want to. But here we go. So uh, why post-campaign messages? People probably wonder, why in the world are you doing this? I remember back when I was a youth pastor back in the 90s, I would take the kids to Super Wow to summer camp each year, and they would come home so fired up spiritually, just on fire for the Lord. And it would only last about two weeks, and then they would go back to normal. And I remember feeling pressure as a youth pastor to try to do something to make it last longer. I remember the pastor would meet with, the senior pastor would meet with me from time to time and say, well, why is this always so short-lived? Uh, I guess it's just human nature. So that's why we're going to do a couple of post-campaign messages for what on earth am I here for? So today we're beginning a new two-week series all about getting started on your spiritual journey. You may just be at the beginning of the road of your spiritual journey. That's a starting point. You may be somewhere in the middle and others who may be on a spiritual high. So how do you start on the next leg of your spiritual journey, especially if you have been on a spiritual high? Uh, what is the highest point on earth? Mount Everest, 29,000 feet. Did you know that about 1,600 people have summited Mount Everest? They've made it all the way to the top. People have been attempting this since 1921. During that period of time, 160 people have died trying to summit Mount Everest. That means that one in 10 die. And for that privilege, they pay about $60,000, 90 days of their lives, and one in 10 don't make it back. Now, what do you think that's about? Now, certainly it's the attraction of saying, I am in a small group of people that did something unique. But there's something about getting to the highest place that's compelling. Now, is it more dangerous to climb Mount Everest or to descend down the slope of Mount Everest? Well, of course, more people have died descending than they did trying to summit. And there's a spiritual application to that. You have to be extra careful coming off of a high place. In weather patterns, would you rather have a high-pressure system or a low-pressure system? You'd rather have a high-pressure system. That's where the stable air is. It is the low-pressure systems that bring the unstable, st stormy kind of weather. If you're not ready for the inevitable lows of life, spiritually and emotionally, you're going to be in trouble. But isn't that true of all of life? Uh, life is a series of ups and downs. Life is a series of highs and lows. In life, you're going to find both the good and the bad. The highs are so good and the lows are so painful that there is something within us that just wants to hang on to the highs. Well, we want to capture as much of heaven on earth as we possibly can. There's a story in the Bible of Jesus on the mountain with his disciples, and they had this unique spiritual and emotional experience and when then, when Jesus was getting ready to descend, the disciples begged, can we just please stay here for a little longer? We just want to hang on to the little pieces of heaven on earth that we get. There's a story about a little boy. He had this pet turtle named Albert, and all of a sudden, the pet turtle, Albert, turns pale and falls on its back, and it lays motionless. And here's this little guy, and tears are streaming down his face, and he carries this little turtle to his dad, and his dad is the ultimate salesman and knows I've got to do a sales job on my broken-hearted kid. So he takes a little turtle, and he puts it in a shoebox, and he says, let me tell you, son, this is the best thing that's ever happened. 
This little turtle is now just walking around up there in heaven. It is so great. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. We'll have a little funeral party and we'll invite all your friends. And after the funeral, we'll have cake and ice cream and games and for all your friends. And it will be great. And the little kid started to smile. So the dad knows he needs to really close the cell. And he said, okay, so let's go outside now and let's have a little burial in the backyard. So they carried the shoebox out into the backyard. And just at the last moment, the little boy opens the lid, peeks inside, and Albert is walking around like nothing had ever happened. With a little disappointed look on his face, he looks at his dad and says, Dad, can we kill him? There's a spiritual point to that story. We want spiritual highs at any price. We do. We, we want to stay spiritually high. But let me ask you, is it possible to stay on a spiritual high? No, it's not. If you read the Bible, what you'll find is that the Bible is a parade of highs and lows, one right after another. Here's some examples. You know the story of Daniel in the Bible. Daniel was very, very faithful to God. That's a high. But because of his faithfulness to God, he was thrown into a den of hungry lions. That's a low. But the lions didn't eat him. That's a high. So you see the pattern. There's the story of Jonah. He runs away from God. That's a low. He's swallowed by a great fish. That is a low. But the fish, the fish vomits him up on dry ground. Now, is that a high or a low? It's a high. In the New Testament, you have Jesus, and he's at his baptism, and his Father's voice is heard from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That was a high. What happened immediately after that? He's in the desert for 40 days being assaulted in temptation, temptation with temptation by the devil himself. That was a low. But what happened after that? He began his ministry of teaching about the kingdom of God and transforming lives and performing miracles. That was a high. But then what happened? He's crucified. That was a low. But then what happened? He arose from the dead and that was a high. So here's what we know. Because Jesus stayed faithful to God in the highs and the lows, it is in the highs and the lows that we will learn to become like Jesus. Right now with this coronavirus going around, we're, we're going through a low like many of us have never seen before. And you may say, well, how will I know if I'm on the right road? How do I get started down this journey? Here, here's a passage of scripture that I would like to spend a few minutes on that describes a group of Christians that obviously had had some spiritual highs in their lives. Revelation 2, verses 2 through 5, Jesus is talking to these Christians, and he says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot endure evil men, and you put to the test those who will call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you, and you have perseverance, and you have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. So just like those of us that went through 40 days of what on earth am I here for, notice the description of these followers of Jesus. They've grown in their faith. It's obvious that they had a clear sense of their purpose. They had served the Lord with gratitude and emotion and joy and diligence, but something had happened. Somewhere along the way in their journey with Jesus, something had changed. Now, it wasn't a work problem. They were working along just fine. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, you're great at work, you're great at perseverance, you're great at endurance. Uh, they were doing the right thing, so it wasn't a work problem. Their, their problem was a love problem. They were suffering from what can adequately be described as heart drift. Have you ever experienced heart drift? Where your heart used to be just inflamed with passion and now it's cold? This happens in male and female relationships all the time. How many of you remember that sick at your stomach, giddy, jumpy, wide-eyed, enthusiastic, passionate kind of love? Do you remember some of you don't remember this, do you? It's been a long, long time. Uh, this is what 
it looks like. Number one, you have an insatiable desire to learn all you can about the other person. I want you to imagine this couple. They're at a romantic dinner, out to eat at a restaurant. Uh, do you remember what that's like? He, he's not even touching his food. Do you know what he's doing? He's talking to her. Yeah, that's amazing, having a live conversation. Tell me about your past. Tell me about your pain. Tell me about your parents. Tell me about your present. Tell me about your plans for the future. But do relationships stay like this? Somewhere along the road, I don't know when it happens, something happens to love. Now, I'm not suggesting that older people can't be in love because they can. We, we all know older people who are passionately in love. But imagine this older couple out to dinner. He's looking at his plate. He's eating, just shoving food in his mouth with both hands. Stuff's falling on his shirt. He's complaining about the price. And they're not talking to each other at all. A second attribute of first love is there's a heavy investment in that love relationship. You're really willing to invest heavily. You want to spend some time together. Uh, no problem. You have all the time in the world. You, you can see this guy saying to her, could I just drive by where you work and wave? Could, could I just come in and just watch you work? Money, not a problem. They're out to dinner. Honey, honey order anything you want. They go to the mall together, and he says, baby, buy whatever you want. Can, can you imagine him going to the mall with him now? <laughs> no. Uh, first of all, he doesn't want to do that. But second, if he's at the mall, it's like he's doing time, hard time. He's looking at the watch, ready to go. A third attribute of first love, you've got this insatiable desire and this heavy investment but then thirdly, there's an intense preoccupation of the heart. See, over here, this young couple, there's no one else, nothing else catching their eye. Nothing else is grabbing at their heart. Why? Because there's no room in their heart for anything else. They are full of love for one another. This was the person to whom you were willing to give reckless abandon. This was the person who got your full devotion, all your affection, Every bit of your esteem. This person was your treasure, but over time something happened and it's sad. Well, what can happen to love? Look at your outline. Well, you don't have an outline, but Revelation 2 4 says something very insightful about love. It does not say you have lost your first love, it says you have left your first love. It was a choice. Actually, it was a small series of choices. Now, some of you have just come through this incredible 40 days. What on earth am I here for? And right now, you're on a high in your relationship with God. Let me tell you what the Bible says to you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And I'll tell you what. Once you do, you will hunger and thirst for more of God. Because He's not only desirable, He's reliable. And for those of you who have thirsted for righteousness and you hunger for God, it's as if your thirst and your hunger seem unquenchable. You cannot spend enough time. You can't leverage enough of your resources. You can't offer enough of your life to God. Love has captured you, and you are a willing captive. It's a spiritual high. Bible study being held, you're there. Worship service going on, you're there. Scripture memory, you're doing it. I mean, if there was a baptism bubble bath, you'd be using it. There is no place you'd rather be, nothing else you'd rather give yourself to. Jesus Christ is the full focus of your heart and your devotion. This is the spiritual high weather system. It's providing sunshine and stability to your life. But if you've lived long enough and paid attention, that jet stream is still blowing, and soon a low-pressure system builds. Clouds and storms cover the weather map of your soul, rain and coldness blow across your heart, and over a series of small choices, you've left your first love. What are you going to do when that happens? What do you do if it's already happened? How do you get started on a new place in the spiritual journey that you've been taking? What steps do you take to a spiritual low place? Revelation 2 also gives the answer. Step 1 
the first step in this journey in verse five, Jesus said, remember, remember. Can some of you remember when you were so spiritually hungry that you couldn't stay away from the church? You didn't care if the service lasted an hour, hour and a half or two hours, three hours. It didn't matter to you. You were just willing to hang out. But what happened? You know, when you were first in love with Christ, you'd come early. People get to church at 9.30 and start fellowship and ready for Sunday school. But but what happened? Uh, you, you were like more like this young couple than this older couple. Uh, like first love. Maybe there was a, a time when you had an insatiable desire to learn about Christ. You made whatever investment in that relationship. Christ was the intense preoccupation of your heart. And all you wanted to do was love him and please him. Do you remember? Let me tell you something. God remembers. He remembers feeling the thrill within you the first time the Bible really spoke to you. Remember that? I mean, it was like a light bulb came on. The, the, the Bible was so pregnant with truth, it was like it gave birth while you read it. You couldn't read it fast enough. It wasn't because of habit. It was a thrill for you. God remembers, and he remembers your courage the first time you talked to someone else about how much Jesus meant to you. He was so proud of you. He felt your heart beating so fast in your chest that you thought it was going to burst. He knew how surprised you were that the words and your efforts were making a difference in someone else's life. It wasn't because of duty. It was because of courage and passion, and he remembers that. And God remembers each time when you truly worship him and you surrender to him, he remembers when tears could easily come to your eyes because you were so filled with gratitude and wonder and amazement and love and grace. And he remembers, he remembers when you pursued him like no other, when he was the object of your deepest affection. And you know what? He misses that. Now, this isn't about trying to create guilt because if the truth were told, you miss that too, don't you? There's a song by Lionel Harris. It's a song where God is the singer and what God says to the listener is, I miss my time with you. Those moments together, I need to be with you each day and it hurts me when you say you're too busy. Busy trying to serve me, but how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? Whatever you do, do not let your work for God destroy the work of God within you. Uh, this is supposed to be about a love relationship with the very one uh, who made you, who created you. So could you take some time this week and maybe take the Bible out and maybe thumb through the pages and maybe there was a time you wrote something in the margin when God spoke to you from these pages? Or maybe you've written something in a journal or something like a spiritual diary and what you do when you you just read a, a former time in your faith where your intense love for God was so red hot. Maybe you just find a quiet place in your heart and you say, God, I miss you too. And I remember and I want to come back. Now look at verse five again. No, notice the st next step you take when you've allowed love to slip. Verse 5 says, repent. Repent. Now, that is a heavy, heavy word. What does that, what does repent mean? I mean, you think about preachers screaming that word with a lot of fire in their voice. The real definition of repent is, I recognize that where I am is not where I am supposed to be. So I turn and I move toward where I'm supposed to be. That's what it is. This, the same truth is found in Lamentations 340, the Bible says, let's take a good look at the way we're living and reorder our lives under God. Uh, what a time as we're all stuck at home with this virus going around to do this. How, how do you move to the place that you want to be with God first? First, you remember, and second, you repent. There's no place for sin in the life of the believer. You repent and you turn from that sin. And number three, this is right out of verse five. You do what you need, what you used to do. 
Do what you used to do. See what you do. What do you do? You you take one step at a time. You you do the next right thing. You know what? You don't get to a spiritual mountaintop in one step, and you will not get through a low valley in one step. So what do you do? You put one foot in front of the other. Uh, you take one right step at a time, and you will successfully make your way through the low places. And let me tell you this: Jesus will be with you always. Uh, some of you at the beginning of what on earth am I here for? If you were, uh, said, I'm going to attend all the Sundays for the 40 days. And some of you did that. And I want to commend you for that. You know what? It would be overwhelming to say, I'll make a church service every week for the rest of my life. How about Bible reading? You know, the daily Bible reading that we started at the beginning of what on earth I'm here for. How many of you are still doing it? Someone told me on the phone yesterday, and it just thrilled my heart that they're still doing it. And they said, Pastor, not just for 10 minutes, but sometimes 20 minutes and 30 minutes. It just thrilled my heart. So so I don't know. what. what, what how about if we, we look at the Bible each morning before we check our email? How about five minutes with the Bible? Just five minutes before you read the newspaper or look at Facebook. How about scripture memory? Some of you... We're memorizing one verse of scripture every week, just one verse of scripture. So maybe from your daily Bible reading, you put one verse of scripture, just one that you'll memorize that week, and you cut it out and you put it on your refrigerator door and you make this commitment. I will not open this refrigerator door until I can say this verse with my eyes closed. Now think about all the weight we're going to lose. But being right and doing right doesn't always feel right. But it doesn't have to. Uh, more is going to be said about that next week. Don't worry about feelings. Write this down. Motion will lead to emotion. Motion will lead to emotion. You take the next right step. Let me give you just two more practical steps. During 40 days, you learn the importance of a church family. Make an, active, an effort to be active in fellowship. Uh, the goal is not just to keep you busy. The goal is not just a bunch of activity. Uh, this is about real change. The expectation is that you start becoming like Jesus, becoming the person God created you to be. This is not about attending or reading or memorizing or doing. It's about really being like Jesus. And when you boil it right down, our character is developed through our obedience and through our trust in God during the highs and during the lows. We trust him when we're up and we trust him, we obey him, and we trust him when we're down and we obey him. Will you choose to love the Lord through trust and obedience? Will you choose to obey all that God teaches you to do? It's not about I'll obey this part, but I'm not going to obey that part. A selective obedience is not obedience at all. That's just called convenience. I'm talking about true obedience to God. I saw on television the other day the church closures, and there was a church entitled The Entire Bible Baptist Church. I like that, The Entire Bible Baptist Church, not just the parts you choose. Following Jesus from the mountain into the valley is a series of small steps, small choices, all in the right direction. Philippians 3.16 says, Now that we are on the right track, let's stay on it. One step, one choice at a time, and in that journey, God, by his spirit in you, forms Jesus in you a little bit at a time. And you become more and more like Jesus. You say, how do I know? How will I know that I'm becoming more and more like Jesus? Galatians 5.16 says, live by the spirit. That means let God, the spirit, work within you. And then he'll produce some fruitfulness in that kind of work. And he describes it here. The fruit of the spirit is this. The fruit of the Spirit is love. You'll be more loving. Joy, you'll be more joyful. Peace, you'll be more peaceful. Patience, you'll be more patient. Kindness, you'll be kinder. Goodness, you'll be better. Faithfulness, more faithful. Gentleness, self-control. That's what happens. 2 Corinthians 8, 11 says, Having started the ball rolling so enthusiastically, you should carry this project through to completion. Just as gladly, let your enthusiastic idea at the start 
be equaled by your realistic action now. Say, okay, I am willing with God's help to try to follow him step by step, o obedience and trust through the highs and through the lows. But maybe you have a question. So, okay, ask, this is your question, I suspect. What if I trip? You already said coming down Mount Everest is more dangerous. So I, as we're all into a low period right now, what if I fell? It's a great question. Here's the answer. Even when you fail, God never does. When you fail, God never does. He is so faithful. He's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Let me tell you what I mean by that. God's care for you will never fail. He'll never stop caring. He'll never stop loving. Has there ever been a time in your life when you needed God's encouragement? You just needed to know he was there and that he cared for you. He will care for you in the highs. And I'm glad to report he is there in the lows. And he's there right now on his throne as we deal with this coronavirus. One final, final thought and then we're done. God's love will never fail. Even when you get messy in life, his love for you is never in question. Several years ago, a lady named Jeanette George wrote about a flight that she had from Tucson to Phoenix. Seated next to her was this young woman with a small little baby. And Jeanette describes the little baby, says she was just so beautiful. She's wearing this white dress. Her hair was fixed with a pink, little pink bow. And this baby was smiling and she kept saying, dad, 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 during the first part of the trip. And the woman explained, we're going home to her daddy. We've been away for a few days and he's going to meet us at the airport. And everybody's just enjoying this adorable little girl. Well, the mom had a thermos bottle and she's feeding this baby juice and fruit, juice and fruit. And then the baby started crying. I guess the ears or something from the, the flying. And the more the baby cried, the more juice and fruit. And then the flight got turbulent. Oh yeah, she throws up. And she had more come up than had gone down. And it was just a huge, huge mess. The baby's face is blotted with red from the crying, her hair, her white dress, just everywhere. And people were assuring this young mother that it was okay handing her tissues while running for cover. When the plane landed, the little girl was fine again. She started saying, dad, 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 dad again. And nobody else was fine, but that little girl, uh, she was fine. Jeanette George says when she got off that flight, she spotted the daddy. She said there he was standing in white pants and a white shirt holding white flowers. And as he walked to embrace his wife, she just handed him the child as she's on her way to the bathroom to clean up. And she said, I thought when he looked at how nasty that little girl had gotten, he would say, she's not my baby. Uh, I don't know whose baby she is, but that's not what happened at all. That daddy took that little girl in his arms and he started kissing her, stroking her hair and saying over and over again, daddy's baby came home. I want to read to you two brief sentences that Jeanette George says, I watched him all the way to the baggage area. He never stopped kissing that baby. And I thought, where did I ever get the idea that Father God is less loving than a young daddy in a white shirt and white pants with white flowers who doesn't care what his little girl looks like or what she smells like. He's just glad she's home. Maybe you've blown it. Really messy. You thought God would never want me like this. You could never be more wrong. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, God wants you to come home to him. It's like coming home. For those of you who are wanting a relationship with God, start the journey today. For those of you who are on your journey, stay steady. Remember his love. Take the next right step. Just keep moving in his direction. Just keep making your way home to him. He wants you in his arms no matter what. Why? Because his love never fails. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for my church family. During a time that we can't meet together, 
And Lord, only a small percentage of my church family is able to see this video. But God, I just thank you for the truth of your precious word and the truth that you love us no matter what. And I just pray that you'll be with all of us, Lord, with everyone in this entire world, especially those that don't know you as their Savior. And that we would all look to you for every our every need. Lord, thank you for promising to meet our every need through Jesus Christ. And we just thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.